Sohrab Homi Frases' new book of North Florida and Elsewhere Stories True Fiction won the 2023 International Book Award for Story Collections. American Book Award winner Rila Skew says of it, true fiction is a tour de force. Frasis is the first Asian American author to win the Iowa Short Fiction Award, described by the New York Times Book Review as among the most prestigious literary prizes America offers. For his first book, Ticket to Minto, Stories of India and America, Publishers Weekly called it a reminder of how satisfying the short story form can be, the work of an impressive new talent. His novel, Go Home, was shortlisted by Stanford University Libraries for the William Sarayan International Prize, Singapore Poetry described it as a newly poignant and even heartbreaking. Um, he taught literature and creative writing at University of North Florida. He was Twin Cities visiting writer in residence at Augsburg College and artist in residence at Yado. He received the Florida Individual Artist Fellowship in Literature and Fiction. The South Asian Literary Association bestowed on him its Distinguished Achievement Award. So Rap will be joined in conversation with local author Michelle Lizette Flores. Michelle is a graduate of FSU and NYU creative writing programs. She is currently working as a teacher and co-host the What's in a Verse Poetry Open Mic in Jacksonville. She has previously been published in magazines and journals such as the Miami Rail, Chiriku Journal, and Travel Latina. A finalist for the Juan Felipe Herrera Award for Poetry, she is the author of chapbooks, Cuentos from the Swamp and Memoria, as well as the picture book, Calito and the Bat Learns to Trick or Treat. So her short fiction can be found in the anthology, Places We Build in the Universe through Flower Song Press. Her full-length collection of poetry, Invasive Species, is forthcoming through Finishing Line Press. But now, Michelle, I'll leave the rest to you. Thank you so much for that introduction. Good evening, Sora. Good evening, Michelle, and thank you for hosting this, and uh, thanks to the library. Yes, agreed. So, let's jump in. Um, I'm a poet by nature. You are a fiction author by nature. Is that adversarial? Or? We'll find out. Uh. See you outside, right? <laughs> um, <laughs> so, I am very curious as to how you would describe your writing practice, because it is probably very different from how mine would function. Yeah, writing practice as in, for instance, how I write, when I'm writing. Uh, exactly. Uh, you know, it goes back a long way and it has changed. I've mm -hmm. been doing this for the past three decades. Mm -hmm. um, uh, I went back to school for my master's in creative writing at the University of North Florida mm. all the way back in 91. <laughs> and so when I was writing at first, I was doing it old school, uh, handwriting, mm -hmm. um, and even editing on paper, lots of s uh, scribbles and loops drawn and scratching out. Um, uh, the one thing that I didn't use was an actual, you know, old school typewriter, mm. but I did, uh, during my MA, use a dedicated uh, Smith Corona word processor. Okay. You know, the one with the little pop-up screen mm -hmm. where you can just see like two lines of... I've seen pictures. <laughs> <laughs> She's age-shaming me. <laughs> <laughs> so, but it's true, yeah. I mean, you know, I'm, I'm old and jaded and uh, uh, at the end of it all, I have, you know, uh, three books that I'm proud of mm -hmm. to show. So then, uh, you know, of course, things evolved and I, um, you know, moved on to everything online and uh, mm -hmm. word processors on PCs first and then laptops and mm -hmm. all that kind of stuff. Now, if you're talking about um, when you said practice, uh, you know, I don't have a daily regimen okay. to speak of. Uh, a lot depends on what phase of the project I'm in. Mm. And uh, my philosophy is not to push it past that phase until it's ready. Mm -hmm. uh, so for instance, if I'm in the conceptual phase, uh, uh, you know, I've got the idea or the germ for the story, then I allow it to incubate. I, you know, mull it over consciously. I think about it uh, and then let it be and find that my unconscious is still working on it. If I need to research things, uh, I do that research. 
whether it's legwork or whether it's reading. Um, and, um, you know, if at the end of all that I need to get a little bit organized, once in a while, if it's a long project, like a novel project, then I might do some bullet pointing. Mm -hmm. You know, I resist outlining because I feel that hems you in a little too much. Mm -hmm. uh, but I don't start drafting. Mm -hmm. I, I hold off uh, because I don't trust myself to jump the gun. I don't like to jump the gun. And there comes a point when I really feel like it's, I'm getting there. Mm -hmm. I'm getting to the point where it, it feels almost ready to come out. And then it, it, it's, it has its own momentum. It, it starts to tell me. Uh, and, and I start to feel the, itch, the urge to, to start drafting. Mm -hmm. And then again, when I'm in the drafting process, uh, I don't rush it. Mm -hmm. If, you know, uh, if there are times when it's not coming, I let it not come. I walk away from it. And um, <clears throat> I use that time, you know, to uh, revise as I go. Mm -hmm. And um, I try, you know, there's the school of thought of letting it, just letting it come out um, and, and then going back and fixing it. And I found it doesn't work for me. It might mm -hmm. work for some people, but it doesn't work for me. Um, because it, I, I end up with a, st a starting point that's less than I want it to be. Mm -hmm. That's, you know, borderline mediocre. Mm -hmm. And then I can't take it from bad to good. Mm -hmm. um, so I, to, to clarify, it's almost like an edit as you go. It is an edit as I go, uh, revise as I go. You know, all those pauses, I make use of them. I reread, uh, you know, revise, edit. And then, of course, at, at the end when I have a draft, Mm -hmm. Then I will, um, you know, edit the whole, and and again I'll hold off before sending it out, you know, submitting it. Mm -hmm. I hate that word actually, yeah. submitting. But uh, <laughs> I uh, I'm wary of again jumping the gun, mm -hmm. uh, and and uh, before it's absolutely the best I can make it. Uh, you know, I don't want to see it in print, and, and it happened to me early that, you know, mm. it was good enough to get into magazines, um, and, and, and then reading it, I felt there was so much more I could have done, mm -hmm. and I didn't want to repeat that kind of experience. Mm -hmm. So, again, I'm patient, and eventually, you know, I send it out. Um, if it comes back with suggestions, um, you know, I listen to those, take care of those, and uh, make it better and send it out again. Mm -hmm. So you seem to be an author who really values taking their time with the process. Mm -hmm. How do you think this connects to this concept of writer's block? Do you believe writer's block actually exists, or is it more of a function of the ebb and flow of the creative process? Yeah, I mean, again, you know, uh, I can imagine certain people for whom it's not real, mm -hmm. but for me it is real. Mm. Um, and uh, I think if it was only about productivity, about producing, mm. uh, about writing, just writing, uh, and not worrying too much about uh, the quality of the product, mm -hmm. because it is a product mm -hmm. eventually, I mean, you know, um, then it would be less of an issue. Mm. Um, but that's something you can do with just free writing, right? I mean, right. you can just let yourself go with free writing and not endanger your, your manuscript. Mm -hmm. uh, so with my manuscript, uh, I do reach points where I'm at a bit of a you know, standstill. Mm -hmm. And I respect it. I respect what my inner instincts are telling me and, and the fact that I'm, I'm, I'm not clear about where to go yet, so I don't force it. Mm -hmm. um, if, if you know, so it, you can call that writer's block, uh, if, if you will. Uh, and and again, the way around it for me is what I described: that whole process of getting to the point where I'm ready mm -hmm. and respecting each phase. Uh, and if if I do that, and if I do my due diligence, you know, and if I have a good idea in the first place, mm. um, that's fine. Then it works out, eventually. <laughs> 
And you saying that made me think about the process of generating a new piece of work. So do you feel like that comes from the free writes that you do, or do you go into projects already having it pre-planned? At yeah. least, because you said you don't outline, but at least an idea of where you want the story to go. Yeah, the concept, right? right. The germ, the nucleus. Mm -hmm. uh, and, and that usually comes to me organically. Mm. It's not, again, it's not something I go seeking. Mm, okay. I don't sit and think, oh, what's my next idea? Mm -hmm. uh, what am I going to write about next? Uh, like, what is marketable, for instance? And I don't think about all those things. Mm -hmm. There are things that, um, you know, whether I encounter them in first person uh, or, you know, second person or just read about them or, or hear about them, whatever, there are some things that s stick with me and, and strike me as a potential idea mm. for a story. Again, you know, for me, it's all about story. Mm -hmm. and, um, and then, you know, I put it, I think about it, I put it at the back of my mind. When it comes to my mind again, I think about it again. Um, and uh, the fact that it's it's intriguing me, mm -hmm. encourages me, and, and that's a long-term thing. It doesn't go away. It's not something easily resolved. Uh, tells me that it's probably good material uh, for mm -hmm. uh, a story, and, and it's probably going to intrigue my reader, too. Yeah. So to shift gears a little bit, we've talked about process, which can be a little bit external. Um, and I wanted to think a little bit more internal in terms of the connection between identity and your writing process. Do you think that there is a connection there, or is this sort of two separate spheres that you operate? There is a connection. There's definitely a connection, but I would say it's more of a connection between uh, identity and my material, or the material for the mm -hmm. stories, or the content mm -hmm. of the stories, rather than the process mm. of writing them. So, I mean, it's unavoidable for me uh, because growing up in Bombay, India, mm -hmm. um, <clears throat> I was born into a tiny little community uh, of barely 100,000 uh, members in a, s a country of a billion. Yeah. Right? Small uh, town, yeah. And so it's a small community of uh, Zoroastrian uh, mm. Persians who migrated from um, ancient uh, Persia as the Persian Empire was crossing over into uh, becoming the modern uh, Arabic Iran mm -hmm. uh, that it is. Uh, and so to preserve their identity, mm -hmm. my ancestors roughly a thousand years ago uh, or whatever uh, fled uh, along. They took to the coastline in little wooden boats or ships mm -hmm. and um, sailed for a year, came to a stopping point at an island, sailed for another year after stopping there and came to the west coast of India and asked permission to stay mm -hmm. for refuge. And so we were, oh my, <laughs> we, my ancestors uh, long ago were among the first refugees. Mm. Um, and they were granted permission on certain conditions, etc. And I guess, you know, when you're a very tiny minority, there's the, 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 the instinct to preserve your identity, and that's what they tried to do. Mm -hmm. So across centuries, they preserved their identity and came to be known as the Parsis mm. of India. Mm -hmm. So identity was important uh, in my life. It then naturally became a part of my material, um, and then part of my stories. And then when you're a transplant, mm -hmm. uh, I mean, uh, and I'm a f first generation immigrant, Mm -hmm. uh, then it's compounded, right? Because mm -hmm. now, not only am I a Parsi Indian, uh, I become a Parsi Indian American. Mm -hmm. And identity is almost increasingly hyphenated um, for me. Uh, and, and so when I wrote my first book, um, 
I literally had the subtitles say stories of India and America. Mm -hmm. uh, and it was organized the way a transplant experiences in, in, the, in that kind of sequence. Mm -hmm. One story in India, the next story mm -hmm. often with the same transplanted character in America. And so identity serving the structure of the story. And it served and the structure of the book more than mm, of okay. the, uh, the stories, but some of the stories too. And then certainly mm -hmm. in the novel, the next book that I wrote, uh, the novel Go Home, mm -hmm. right? Uh, then which raises the question, where is home? Right. Uh, uh, and, and where do you belong? Mm -hmm. um, or do you belong? Mm -hmm. uh, and all those kinds of things. Um, so in, in, in Go Home, uh, yes, there were parts of the story that take place in India, parts that take place in America, and the back and forth, uh, not you know, constricted within one story in, in India, one story in America. Mm -hmm. They were now blending and going back and forth. Yeah. Um, so identity... Uh, continues to be important in, 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 in true fiction. I think it's branching out for me. It, mm -hmm. it, it kind of um, became less of uh, you know, just the, the Indian or the Parsi or the American or Indian American aspect as so much as a kind of a global identity. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, uh, uh, um, uh, a village, as the global village, as they used to refer to. Right. So, like a global villager. Uh, and so, my opening story, uh, Open Mic, has. Yes. I love that story. A spread. Thank you. Yeah. <laughs> as someone who runs an open mic, it felt very real. <laughs> oh, good. Yeah. Good. Yeah, it's based on uh, my experiences at an open mic. And, mm -hmm. you know, the, you get a, a variety of, of people attending. And, and they tend to be colorful characters, mm -hmm. you know. And so in open mic, you've not only do you have the, the aspiring guitarist, Max, right mm -hmm. here in, in Riverside, mm -hmm. uh, but you also have the, the Rwandan refugee, mm -hmm. Henri, and you have uh, the Persian Indian American narrator, Parvis, mm -hmm. right? So you're getting the spread. Uh, yeah. And so. Uh, Identity started for me to become larger and larger and larger. That was the trend. Yeah. And so with a uh, several of the stories, then I, I moved right. Uh, you know, right out of uh, uh, any of those particular identities and uh, even out of in, into identities that don't exist in my more fantastical stories in, mm -hmm. in true fiction. Yeah. Um, when you were speaking about your ancestral history, there was a lot that I could connect with as well, being the uh, child of Cuban refugees, also having the experience of being a hyphenated American in all of its complexities. And so you also speaking to shifting away from writing stories that are more connected to personal identity and moving into uh, you know, just different ways of uh, presenting stories to the world. Do you ever get concerned that as an author of color, you are then being pigeonholed into writing very specific stories based off your own experiences? Or do you feel like that is something you find yourself actively working against as you continue to write? Great question. Um, yeah, it's, uh, it's almost double-edged, right? Because you, uh, A, if, you're, if your community or your identity or whatever, or the label that you were born into, uh, and I sometimes think of them as labels because mm -hmm. they're social labels, you right. know? Uh, they're not stamped on your forehead when you come out uh, or when you're born. But nevertheless, if, for instance, the Parsi community, I mean, one of the driving motivations for, for writing for me was I couldn't find any uh, or, uh, or, or very few, if at all, uh, uh, books about uh, people like me from my community. Mm -hmm. um, so if, if, if you've feel that there is that kind of being, that marginal, uh, marginalization, mm. uh, then on the one hand, you want to bring it to the fore, right? Mm -hmm. uh, you don't want it to be ignored. And so that was part of what pushed me to write those stories. Mm -hmm. um, but on, on the other hand, you don't want to feel confined uh, to a box, right? right. 
You don't want to feel boxed in, and, and there's that urge to break out of the box and find really our common humanity. Mm -hmm. I mean, ultimately, that's what we are, you mm -hmm. know, human beings. And then we have these various lovely communities, yes. You know, they're colorful, they make uh, life vibrant. Right. They're great at the bottom of it all. We're human beings, we're right. all human beings, you know. And then uh, even beyond that, we're, we're, we're living creatures, right? Right. So you can push past all of that, and, and some of my stories in true fiction do. Mm -hmm. And so thinking about the human connection, I want to sort of break out of craft a little bit and think more about community. Um, writing is probably one of the most isolating art forms that there is, simply because of the nature of the process. And yet you and I know each other previously through um, events like Jacks by Jacks, doing things like this, lit chats, and, and just again, open mics and so on. So for you, what do you feel like is the function of community um, within your writing process or just who you are as an artist? Yeah, I, I think community is important. It's not primary, mm -hmm. but it's an important secondary. Mm -hmm. um, and um, yes, of course, locally, you know, uh, events like annual events like Jacks by Jacks, you and I were before uh, talking about the Douglas Anderson mm -hmm. Writers Festival. Uh, uh, yeah, there, there have been University of North Florida Festival mm -hmm. that used to be and is no longer, I think, um, FSCJ had uh, uh, a First Coast Writers Festival. And all of these are, are important as, you know, kind of growing mechanisms, support structures, mm -hmm. uh, outlets. Um, and then later on as a way of giving back. Mm. Right? Uh, conducting workshops uh, for uh, up and coming writers like Jacks by Jacks has uh, last Sunday sessions and, right. and I've, I've done a fiction workshop for them last month. Mm -hmm. uh, those kinds of things. Uh, uh, so, yes, local community uh, is great. It does make you feel less isolated mm -hmm. in a, a fairly solitary pursuit. Um, but I think then also. Again, you have to move outward and, mm -hmm. and beyond local community to larger and mm. larger communities. Like you didn't, uh, uh, you, you, you had a great community, I'm sure, at FSU. Mm -hmm. And then you had another uh, community at NYU, mm -hmm. right? And, and they're both valid, mm -hmm. they're both terrific. Uh, they, I'm sure they're both serving you well in, mm -hmm. in your career. Uh, so that kind of thing becomes important too, uh, to understand the, the larger community of writers. And I, you know, I've encountered so many fun metaphors uh, for that kind of community. I remember I used to, uh, in my writing, uh, semester, uh, writing workshop semesters at UNF, I used to have my students um, read a story by Richard Brodigan mm -hmm. called One Third, One Third, One Third, mm -hmm. uh, which is like about, this, about the smallest uh, complete community of writers that you can have, mm -hmm. like of three people. So there's this, the narrator is this young, almost a kind of uh, loosely young Brodigan writing in the Pacific Northwest, mm. and, and uh, he, he just has a trailer, and he has a typewriter, mm -hmm. right? The one thing that I never used. Uh, <laughs> it's very Pacific <laughs> And <West. laughs> so people in the other trailers can, can hear him going at it on the typewriter, mm -hmm. and he's approached by this uh, uh, young woman uh, who says, oh, you, you're the guy who has a typewriter, right? Um, and uh, she says, well, um, my boyfriend is a writer, mm -hmm. uh, and uh, well, actually he's a logger, <laughs> you know. <laughs> so, uh, but he writes, and he writes well, and uh, so. But we don't have a typewriter. You have a typewriter. So, how about he writes his novel, mm -hmm. uh, I edit it, and then you type it up, mm. and then we split it three ways. <laughs> One third, one third, one third. Yeah. Right. So there you have that little writing community. You have the, uh, you have the writer, you have the editor, uh, and you have the 
publisher, sure. if you will, right? So that kind of tickled me, and uh, no spoilers about how it works out, but it has uh, a wonderful closing line, and I don't think that's a spoiler. Uh, uh, as the young narrator uh, is uh, taking his first look at the manuscript that she gives him, um, he thinks of this as being a kind of a, uh, a community of writers and, and he says something about uh, there we were uh, pounding at the gates of American literature. Mm. And that's the end of the story. Mm -hmm. And so he includes, if it's a young Brodigan, it's a very generous, inclusive statement because there's this logger, uh, there's this woman who's on welfare and uh, has no education in, uh, as a professional editor, uh, and he is going, on, going to go on to become legendary mm -hmm. in American fiction, uh, and, but he says there we all were pounding at the gates of American literature. Mm -hmm. uh, and of course I think, again, I think of it as something larger beyond, I mean, we can think of it as uh, nowadays as uh, pushing past American literature, which is fantastic, of mm -hmm. course, uh, to a world literature, mm -hmm. if you will, right? Yeah. Something larger. Uh, other metaphors that I have encountered, you can think of it as a pool, right? A pool of writers. Mm -hmm. and, and so I, I had an almost literal experience of that metaphor when after my first book um, won the Iowa Award, uh, I was invited to be a fiction fellow uh, on a fellowship, so f a fiction fellow uh, at uh, the Sewanee Writers Conference in Tennessee mm -hmm. at the University of the South. And that's one of the largest uh, writers' conferences in, in the country. Uh, hundreds of uh, writers, aspiring writers, authors, uh, editors, uh, magazine editors, book editors, uh, all in the same place on, on that campus, lovely idyllic campus mm -hmm. for uh, a fortnight, a whole fortnight, mm -hmm. for two weeks. And, <coughs> uh, and there are all these big names, uh, you know, walking around and giving presentations and uh, so on and so forth. Um, but I remember it most vividly for uh, a little uh, illicit tradition that it had uh, toward the end of the conference where people started spreading the word, okay, this is what we're all gonna do, and this happens every year. Uh, we're all gonna go to this local reservoir mm -hmm. of water off campus, uh, and we're gonna go skinny dipping. <laughs> <laughs> it was only the second time in my life, and this is 20 years ago, okay? Yeah. So, uh, haven't done it since then. Allegedly. Uh, uh, allegedly. <laughs> I've done it once before as a college mm -hmm. kid in India. Mm -hmm. so, I've, so now my, the two times I've ever done it, once in India, once uh, in America. Uh, but there it was, the, the literal metaphor of a pool of, there, were about, there must have been 30 or 40 of us mm -hmm. who were rounded up and uh, I said, do you want to do this? And like, why not? You know, what an yeah. experience. One time. And just a gorgeous nighttime, and you know, no one really exchanging names or anything, mm -hmm. but just like a human experience <coughs> between writers in this very uh, organic setting and situation. Yeah, mm -hmm. yeah, it was fantastic. I mean, uh, so I remember that as a pool of writers and a pool of commu a national community of of writers. You know? So ways to build writing community, skinny dipping <laughs> in the middle of nowhere, or attending a festival for writers. Got it. Excellent advice. Um, so now I want to shift gears and talk a little bit about the book True Fiction, the reason mm -hmm. why we're all here. Um, what was your inspiration for this very interesting collection of stories? So really, um, I wasn't even thinking about a full book or a collection. Um, over the years, I was just writing stories that 
the ideas for which had come to me mm -hmm. and I felt like I really wanted to write these stories. Mm -hmm. um, so then at some point, one of those stories uh, was inspired uh, by a real conversation that I had with an old friend uh, who uh, had in the past uh, felt that he could recognize himself because he was an old old friend. Uh, mm -hmm. He could recognize himself as one of the characters or in one of the characters in my novel, Go Home. Or maybe even uh, one of the stories in Ticket to Minto. Um, and, uh, you know, usually I think when people do that, they don't realize that composite characters are, you know, a kind of a mishmash of, uh, you know, a bunch of people's traits that you've, you know, and, and that you've come to psychologically understand. Mm -hmm. uh, they're not any one person. There's no one-to-one -one correspondence mm -hmm. uh, between any one person and, and, and a character. But he'd kind of taken it, you know, as being him. And, uh, <laughs> and he said to me, you know what, you should write true fiction. Mm. So, uh, and the way he meant it w was with the emphasis on fiction. Mm -hmm. uh, and in the sense that, you know, you should make it all up. Mm -hmm. uh, that's what fiction is. That's mm -hmm. true fiction, mm -hmm. right? And then I'm thinking to myself, but you can put the emphasis on it's true, true right? also. And, and then it becomes fiction that has its basis in truth, uh, uh, emotional truth, emotionally true, not necessarily mm -hmm. factually true, uh, because after all, it's still fiction, right? So it's both those words taken together uh, that kind of rang that little, uh, 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 sent off that little eureka bulb, mm -hmm. lit it up in my head because like this paradox, um, and uh, so then, you know, I still wasn't thinking of books or anything, I, but I worked on the story. Uh, and it became this lovely, complicated mm -hmm. uh, story about uh, a couple of parallel stories running together. The story of uh, the character who says this to the narrator mm -hmm. uh, and then we learn more about both their lives and how they've evolved right. uh, and we can find some parallels mm -hmm. and um, so it turned out to be a really nice story uh, it was published by Flock magazine mm -hmm. uh, and um, once I had it in place, then I started to think about other stories that I'd written and published in other magazines. And some of the stories, unlike my first two books, had been not in the school of realism, but uh, rather, you know, more out there, more fantasy, you know, touching on science fiction, like even uh, one of the very first stories I'd ever written uh, <coughs> was a adult fairy tale um, uh, and I put those aside in terms of uh, they, they didn't feature in my first collection of stories which were all in the school of realism mm -hmm. so they wouldn't fit and <coughs> I always thought there was no way that I could bring this whole mishmash of uh, stories uh, together unify them in, in, in one collection but once I wrote true fiction, mm. then it started to strike me that this was a kind of umbrella category uh, that could absorb any kind of story, really. Which I think speaks to what you were saying earlier in the conversation about waiting for the work to let you know when it's ready and not necessarily rushing the process because yeah. eventually you will see the pieces connect yeah. if you give it the time it needs to really breathe and settle and, right. and allow yourself as a writer to grow to bring everything together. Yes, yeah. So, I mean, I wasn't even thinking about a book or a collection. Mm -hmm. Once that happened, then, then you know, uh, I started to think about uh, I still had a missing piece uh, to be my concluding story, mm -hmm. right? Uh, a and uh, in a way, that is sort of the story that I was 
named to write. Mm. It's the story of an ancient Persian legend, mm -hmm. uh, which is actually my naming story. Mm -hmm. uh, and I put it off and put it off because it was a very difficult project to, to tackle, mm -hmm. right? I mean, mm, uh, about a real place and a real time, uh, happening in a real place and a real time, but so many thousands of years ago. Mm -hmm. um, and uh, already out in legend form uh, and, and famous out in the East, but barely known here in the West, mm -hmm. you know? So I I'd, I'd procrastinated and ultimately, uh, during the COVID lockdown, mm. I uh, said I've got no more excuses and I've got all the time on my hand. <laughs> you know, what are you going to do uh, du during lockdown if right. you're single <laughs> and on your own? Uh, 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 Write you, some you, true you fiction. Yeah. Or play a lot of Wordle. Yeah, or play know. a lot of Wordle. <laughs> <laughs> that too. <laughs> so, but then I sat down to write the legend of uh, Sorab and R Rustam and Sorab. Mm -hmm. um, and uh, when I pulled it off, you know, and, and it wasn't easy um, uh, because I wanted to update, uh, to bring, you know, to bring to bear all the modern creative writing technique mm -hmm. that I had acquired and learned uh, on, on this ancient legend mm. and, and make it the best that a uh, modern craft could make it. Mm -hmm. um, and uh, I've heard good things from reviewers, so I think I may have pulled it off. I think you did too. Yeah, thank you. Um, so thinking about that, your fiction has a very humorous, satirical edge. What are some of your influences on your style of fiction? What do you read to help you in inspire and learn some of that craft? Because I think pulling off humor is a very difficult thing to do in writing. Yeah, yeah, I think you're right. I think especially if you try to, right. if you aim for it, you know, it's probably not going to be work out. Oh, gonna, gonna work out. It's, it, it, it's probably best if, you, if it happens organically. Mm -hmm. And in my case, I, I don't try to be funny. Mm -hmm. You know, I don't try to write funny. Um, but life, you know, is it's funny. funny yeah. at times. I right. mean, it, it's, it's serious, it's tragic. Uh, but what makes those sides of it bearable is the humorous side mm -hmm. to it, you know? So all of that is the life experience. And um, so I've always been open to, to, to uh, because for me, it's all about exploring life, mm -hmm. you know, and, and, and my experience and coming to understand life better okay. and, and ourselves, uh, you know, uh, um, uh, to understand uh, the human experience. Uh, mm -hmm. and, and uh, psychology and, and so on and so forth. And so um, it's, not a, it's not so much influences. I don't think I've had actual influences um, uh, except unconsciously. I may have imbibed mm. by osmosis, you mm -hmm. know, but not in the sense of, uh, oh, I'm gonna write like this mm -hmm. or like this particular kind of writing or this particular author um, so back in the uh, when I was growing up in India mm -hmm. uh, I mean there were uh, humorous writers that I can recall in my childhood mm -hmm. reading and enjoying there was this British Indian uh, sorry British uh, uh, writer PG Woodhouse mm -hmm. uh, who was famous for his Butler Jeeves Mm -hmm. But I didn't care so much about uh, Jeeves as for uh, a, a younger, uh, because I was young, uh, a, a younger character that he had, a less famous uh, uh, character called Smith. Mm -hmm. Now, you would think that that's an ordinary name, but Smith was this smart, young uh, Brit guy who resented being put in a box with all those other Smiths, like mm. dozens of Smiths. Mm -hmm. So he changed his, the spelling of his name to P-S-M-I-T-H. <laughs> <laughs> so he was Smith. Oh, yeah. uh, and so I remember novels by P.G. Woodhouse like uh, Leave It to Smith mm. uh, and, and things like that, which was you know, fabulous. So, so of course I learned to enjoy humor mm -hmm. in writing as well. And there's so many other books that uh, even though they're serious books and, and they have 
um, yet they have an edge and they have a sense of un an underlying sense of humor mm -hmm. to them you know that uh, that I've enjoyed um, mm -hmm. yeah, and, and probably unconsciously been influenced by too definitely so well Actually, oh, we are going to open it up to audience the questions. Of the <laughs> <laughs> so sorry. It's okay. I'm I also ramble on. I'm sorry. <laughs> <laughs> I hate to interrupt such a wonderful flow for the interviews, but we are going to open up for audience questions at this time. Um, so thank you so much so far for such a wonderful conversation. So Rob and Michelle. Um, so for people here in our audience, we do have the note cards on the clipboards that were on your chairs. So if you have a question, please do write it down and we'll pass it along to Michelle. That way we can ensure our Zoom audience can hear the questions. Um, and for our Zoom audience, please type it in and we'll have someone write it and get it over. Um, so we do have some people who got ahead. So I do have some questions ready, so I'll leave it. Okay, our first question, how do you find inspiration and are there specific things you do when trying to come up with ideas? Yeah, I mean, I wish I did have a, a foolproof method for that. But yeah, again, my answer is really just be observant, mm -hmm. uh, you know, because the, I mean, life is full of potential ideas and, and the, I mean, remarkable things happening all the time and in our, in our times, I think, you know, there's this whole thing about fact being stranger than fiction nowadays sometimes. Yes. I mean, so you, you can't write some of the characters that you find in politics, right? Uh, so, um, yeah, the, uh, it's, it's just uh, keep your eyes open, keep your ears open, uh, and when something strikes you as really, really intriguing, and then it stays with you, and you just can't, it nags at you, and you just can't get rid of it, uh, of the thought of it, uh, and it surfaces every now and then, my time might go by. That's a good idea. That's, that's inspiration that you're getting right from the best source. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, it's going to be authentic uh, inspiration. Um, and um, maybe because you're close enough to it, I mean, you will be able to bring a certain degree of authenticity to it mm -hmm. yourself. Our next question, you've spoken of stories living with you until you need to write them. What are some of the stories you've lived with longest before writing them, and are there any stories you've resisted writing until they forced your hand? Yeah, so actually I did say, uh, you know, the, uh, my naming legend, I mean, you know, I've had that name since the day I was born, right? And, uh, and I probably heard of the legend, um, in my childhood uh, and uh, w was probably captivated by it um, uh, and yet it's the after three decades of writing it's it took me that long to to mm -hmm. come to to writing it mm -hmm. and as of now it's the last thing I've written mm -hmm. uh, you know I wrote a bunch of other things than my naming story before I wrote that. What was the first part of the? The first part was, what are some of the stories you live with the longest? Oh yeah, so that is. And then the second part was, um, were there any stories you resisted writing until they forced your hand? Yeah, I mean, like and, and to some both. extent I did resist this. Now, but now, uh, the other uh, facet to this question could be, what is the story that uh, I'd written the longest ago before it appeared in one of my books. And that actually you can think of as the, the start of the, the, the literal f physical uh, start of true fiction because uh, I wrote a story, uh, remember I mentioned an, an adult fairy tale. Mm -hmm. uh, so I wrote an adult fairy tale uh, as practically one of the first two stories I ever wrote 30 years ago, mm. like uh, this was in 1990. Mm -hmm. uh, and I'd run into this, uh, this uh, young woman who was hyphenated like ourselves uh, and had this mishmash of identities going around. Uh, she was a uh, uh, Persian, Indian, Canadian 
Mm. Uh, you know, and she, I remember her sharing with me that uh, <coughs> uh, after her first breakup, she couldn't stop crying for three days, mm. she mm -hmm. told me. Now, you know, I, I took it very literally because I'm sure she meant like, uh, yeah, you know, I mean, for three days I couldn't get over it. I, you know, uh, every time I thought of it, I cried. But in my head, she was just crying, crying. Mm -hmm. She was eating and, and crying. crying. <laughs> she, was, she was talking to people and crying. Yeah. <laughs> she was sleeping and crying. Mm -hmm. In her dreams, she was crying. Mm -hmm. You know, everything, nonstop. For Very hydrated, yes. <laughs> <laughs> so I wrote that adult fairy tale about, mm -hmm. uh, and initially the working title was A Plain Fairy, uh, or The Plain Fairy, sorry. Uh, and so she was, the character was, a, was transformed into a plain fairy mm -hmm. uh, in fairyland where everyone is very beautiful mm -hmm. uh, uh, and handsome and she falls in love with a uh, fairy prince who dumps her, right? Mm -hmm. Which brings us to the whole uh, crying thing and, uh, and now uh, that, the three days of nonstop crying became three decades mm. of non-stop crying. For, for three decades, the plain fairy mm -hmm. couldn't get over uh, her grief. Mm -hmm. uh, and her grief expands and becomes larger than just the breakup grief. It's grief for, uh, you know, human beings who are in misery because they are sent down uh, on ferry missions. Mm -hmm. uh, uh, and uh, she develops this compassion for human beings and slowly as I drafted the story changed and the working title changed from the plain fairy to a uh, coming mm. and it, beca it became the story of a budding female messiah mm -hmm. um, who confronts a non-gendered godhead mm -hmm. and says to him, if, if you are the cause of all the grief I see around me, then it's no wonder you don't show us your face. Mm -hmm. And the godhead says, uh, oh, you've seen my face before and you'll see it again. Uh, and she says to him, don't talk in riddles to me, <laughs> you know, show yourself or leave me alone. Mm -hmm. And that's a very ambitious scene to set yourself up for when it's only your first, your second story you're ever writing. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> so I look back and, and I think I did a pretty good job of it. I'm, I'm, I'm uh, impressed enough. Uh, it came out first in uh, a, uh, an anthology called America's Emerging uh, Science Fiction and Fantasy Writers. Mm -hmm. and, and then finally, because I had this uh, umbrella category title true fiction mm -hmm. I was able to find a put place it in, in true fiction and mm -hmm. you can read it, the full encounter uh, between the plain fairy and the godhead yeah. who shows himself and I think that story you just described leads really well into this next question do you have any ideas for stories that you think could be great but that you probably wouldn't be able to write so either because they don't fit your style or maybe the concept is just not something you can wrap your head around do you have any stories that might fit that? I mean, yeah. Uh, you know, I think I, I may have a couple more. I, I know I have at least one more book in, in me that I'm uh, starting to work on mm -hmm. because I needed a bit of a break. Yes. Uh, and, and now those energies are starting to fill up. My tank is starting to fill up again. The, mm -hmm. the empty tank is no longer on empty. <laughs> um, and it's this this one's a book I can I can write so but beyond that another uh, idea for at least a story if not a book uh, came to me and I keep thinking that I may not be able to write it well mm. it's a dystopian uh, uh, concept mm -hmm. and uh, you know until uh, true fiction I wrote in the uh, school of realism right. and no um, uh, genres mm -hmm. uh, 
but now I've been dabbling with genres and pulling them off, I think. But this one I'm not too sure that, that I can pull off. And, mm -hmm. and I don't want to write uh, something that I can't do well. Right. So I may not write that one. Interesting. Um, so shifting gears, do you write from a harmony of your hyphenated identities or do you write from each identity separately? Um, it depends on the story. Uh, the story guides me in everything. If, if the particular story that I'm writing has to do with a particular identity, mm -hmm. you know, um, yeah, then it's, it, to me it's, it's about the character and it's about the story. And if, if that, I, I explore the character while telling the story, uh, and, and if that character is, you know, belongs to a particular community that, that I can uh, do justice to, mm -hmm. uh, then, yeah, it's, it's just the one. Um, uh, if, like, you know, some of the stories uh, that were purely in India, you know, mm -hmm. uh, but then the stories that had transplants in America, you know, then you had uh, the hyphenation coming into play because right. uh, that transplanted character had all of that going into his or her makeup. Mm -hmm. um, and sometimes that hyphen is the identity. And yeah. it's not necessarily two separate things. Yeah, yeah. Uh, but to me, ultimately, it's not, it's not so much about uh, identity labels. The, it's, mm -hmm. a, it's more about the story and mm -hmm. the character and, and the story. Between those two, they'll, uh, you know, the various other things will reveal themselves mm -hmm. and will come to the fore. I don't actually sit and think, okay, I'm going to... Uh, create this particular kind of character and, and uh, talk about all these hyphenations and mm -hmm. so on. You know. So it, it's more organic, organic than that. Yes. Um, so then thinking about that, how do you go about your research process to then create your stories? Is it through ac an academic process? Is it more anecdotal? Is it like, uh, I believe what you had shared earlier, more of just like living life and being really observant? Or is it a combination of things? Yeah, it's, I mean, it depends on the story, again. Everything mm -hmm. depends on the story. The particular mm -hmm. story guides you, you know, and, and if it requires uh, legwork, you know, then you have to do the legwork. If it requires uh, reading research, then you have to do the reading research. I mean, for my, uh, uh, my thesis stories, mm -hmm. my creative writing thesis uh, stories, uh, I uh, flew back. To, to India mm. because I couldn't uh, depend on myself to, to write some of the settings uh, out of memory and do justice to them, be authentic and accurate enough. So I flew to my hometown of Bombay, researched some st uh, stuff there. I took a train to the hill station of Kandala, researched another story mm -hmm. uh, and its settings and, uh, there, flew to the city of Patna and researched the, the title story, what would become the title story of my first book, Ticket to Minto, mm -hmm. there in, in, in Patna, and the social setting, uh, <coughs> because settings are you know, more than just physical, geographical, they're also settings in uh, society, settings in culture, set settings in time, and so on and so forth. So I did all that legwork because I had to, mm -hmm. uh, in order to write them well. Uh, there are some that uh, you know, maybe are more conceptual, stories and, and, and then they can maybe all pour out of, out of you. Like mm -hmm. when I uh, set out to write an alternate world story uh, uh, that you'll find in, in true fiction called mm -hmm. The Straight, you mm -hmm. know, uh, it was all coming out of my internal understanding of just human and beyond human nature, just nature, nature, mm -hmm. really. Um, so it varies from story to story. That's what it depends on. It's not, there's no formula ever. Yeah. For, there, there, there's no blueprint ever, you know? So each time you're setting out and you have to feel your way along and you have to find the, the best way. I can definitely identify with that as uh, I took my first trip to Cuba in 2018, the year before my first chat book was published. Uh -huh. and I think that was really instrumental in just understanding my identity as a Cuban American person because that's really what the collection was about. Whereas my second chat book, Memoria, was more about the 
matrilineal lineage of my family and focused a lot on all of these very strong Cuban women that I come from. And so I think there is something to connecting to back to that ancestral place, but then also moving past it and, and thinking about possibilities beyond it. Absolutely. Yeah. And so next question, since you left any kind of school for writing, have you continued to work with a writing group or to exchange drafts with anyone or um, you know, any sort of like process and community-based writing process? I mean, I did for, uh, for the first two books I did. Uh, you know, for the stories in Ticket to Minto, uh, I was working with a writer's group at FSCJ. Mm. Um, um, no, I take that back. Uh, there was an earlier uh, writer's group um, that I was working with, and then for the novel, I was working with the FSCJ writer's group. Mm. But with this uh, book, uh, you know, the stories came sporadically now and then, mm -hmm. uh, and uh, so I didn't work with anyone uh, on them. Uh, a couple of them, I got suggestions from uh, editors, uh, mm. you know, or, or comments that I took into uh, account. And then some, a couple of them were solicited by anthologies. Mm. Um, <coughs> there was an anthology called uh, uh, We Can't Help It If We're From Florida. <laughs> you know, came out uh, in uh, Orlando uh, from Orlando's Borough Press. Mm. And so they had 20 stories from around the state of uh, Florida. Mm -hmm. um, and uh, they asked me for one, and mm -hmm. uh, they liked it, and and published it, mm -hmm. you know. So. Yeah, and Ryan Rivas, who runs that press, is an amazing. Ryan author. Rivas, correct. Yeah, Ryan Rivas, yes. Thank you for correcting that. We. All right. Well, thank you so much.